Hi guys, I'm Tracy. Welcome to today's video. And so I have a very unexpected or kind of like a last minute CB Japan haul. I was going to wait to do this because I have a few more coming in, but most of these are outlet brushes. So in case some of them are in stock, I thought maybe I'd, you know, get this info to you guys right away. So um, I just got them. I'm, I'm literally unpacking them right now. So I have not used any of these. But I was really, really excited to try these outlet brushes. I've seen these being um, posted on CD Japan for a while. I just, um, I don't know, just never really interest me. And then I saw a lot of posts on Instagram about how amazing they are and what great deals they are. So I went ahead and I picked four of the outlet brushes and they're all a hodo. And then I got one more. Um, I'll save that one for the end. I got a powder brush that was not a outlet brush. So let me start out. I got three of them are eye brushes and one is a, I think a cheek brush. So let me start out with the smallest brush. Now this one is, okay, it's the number 257 shadow liner brush. So this one really reminds me of the Hakuhodo G5513, that little itty bitty horse packing brush, because this is um, horse hair as well. I hope that is, there you go. So it's just one of those little itty bitty packing brushes and I really do like these and uh, such an amazing deal. I just could not resist getting another one of these and I know I use this shape. So the handle is not super short, but it's not long. It's pretty lightweight, but it's very shiny. It looks very nice, you know, and it's got the pointy tip, which uh, I like the look, but you do have to be careful when you're storing these that they don't get, um, you know, damaged on the bottom. But there, it's it feels like a Hakuhodo horse brush, and I believe the dimensions are almost identical to the G5513. In fact, it's a little bit smaller. I'll show you that up close tiny bit narrower but I believe they're both seven millimeters actually this one the, the a holder looks a little bit shorter so this might be like six and a half I believe it's like six and a half but um really excited for this one and you know mainly because it was um pretty inexpensive and then I got a another packing brush it's the number 260 and it's the same um, same deal except it's much bigger and in fact I can compare it here's the Hakuhodo and here's the outlet brush actually the outlet brush is a little bit wider so this is the Hakuhodo 242 HS so it's a little wider I believe they have one with exact Hakuhodo has an exact um, option like this it's it's actually um, I don't know if it's more flexible softer and more flexible than the uh, Hakuhodo ones. See how like easily it bends? The Hakuhodo ones are quite stiff, but um, I don't know that, I think that might work out nice if you're a little bit gentler on your, on your eyes. So yeah, so far really, really impressed. So this, this must come from like the same line because the hairs are the same and you know, everything else is the same. So those are the two packing brushes. And then I got a gray squirrel um, blending brush. And of course, because this is kind of like a Wayne Goss 3, I was really curious as to how it would compare. But now that I have it, it this one, it reminds me more of the Chikuhodo Z11 because it's not as tapered. It's a little bit flatter and domed and it's more flexible. It's, it's pretty flexible just like the, the Chikuhodo is. And it's very soft, very, very soft. It's a round ferrule, but the hairs are kind of flattened. So I don't know if that's because it was, you know, in packaging or not. It's probably because it was in packaging, but it looks like a completely round ferrule. And really, so really um, surprisingly impressed with the quality of the hairs. Um, very short handle, kind of like the, um, the Koyuto, premium series like a lot of the smaller eye brushes that I've been getting just like that but um, you know you can't go wrong with a very soft uh, squirrel blending brush they're just so useful 
So um, did I say that was the number 269? And then the face brush that I got is the 282 blush brush. And this is squirrel and goat hair. Wait, this does not feel like goat hair. I think this is just gray squirrel. Oh, this is 100% gray squirrel, still available. And this one I was really, really looking forward to because it kind of like what I was thinking was like Wayne Goss Airbrush, but heavier or Hakuhodo K002. You know, both um, that the Hakuhodo one is quite expensive and this one is so soft. It's more, I would say more flexible than most brushes but really, really high quality. N no like mistake that I can see. The handle looks in like in perfect condition. Ferrule is in perfect condition. Hairs look perfectly bundled. I was just thinking like some of them would be damaged because they do warn you that the outlet brushes can be. All right, well, I'm gonna put some pictures on my Instagram if you wanna see more up close um, pictures of this, but this will probably be really good for powdering. Um, also blush, I think, and even highlighter, if you wanna use a squirrel hair brush and do like a more um, gradual, a lighter application of highlighter, blush, probably a little small for bronzer, but um, I think a great alternative if you wanted the airbrush or you wanted the, the K020 from Hakuhodo, um, much, much more hair than the airbrush, much more substantial than the airbrush, and um, nothing that I have quite like this except for the airbrush, but I would say this one's better. I mean, so much, it just feels like like so much more brush, you know? And I believe it came out to it's less than the airbrush, but so far I'm really, really pleased with these outlet brushes. I'm so glad I picked them up so thank you guys for posting those pictures and kind of gave me the confidence to go ahead and order them so um, from what I can say I think the outlet brushes are great deals and I'll be looking out for them you know in the future in fact I ordered another one I um, ordered the, the 0277 and um, I'll get that shortly I was gonna combine them but I wanted to get this up sooner than later and then I got the um, Muragishi Sangyo My Sakura Powder Brush. So this is the bigger, bigger one of of the the blush brush. I I showed this in my last uh, CD Japan haul and. This was because um, Shelly recommended it on CD Japan, and I'm really impressed with this. I really like it. These are uh, gray squirrel and um, goat hair. Um, but this one, it, it's very flat. Actually, I thought it would be rounder. It's very flat. And for now, it feels softer than the blush brush. It does feel softer but these are mixes so it's not going to be like it's not going to be super silky like a um scroll hair like a full school scroll hair brush but um because these are mixes they have you know the combination of the soft and silkiness of the scroll hair but the resilience and the pickup of a goat hair it's just different because these are dyed so you can't you know see the different hairs like you can with some of the other series but um I have, except for like the foundation brush, now I have most of this collection and I really, really like it. I am, I kind of wish this was rounder because for when I hear powder brush, I do picture rounder like this. This is completely round. I thought it would be a bigger version of this for some reason, but you know, when you see pictures online, it you know looks one way and it's could be very different but yeah it's pretty flat I, this is a paddle shape definitely paddle shape but I think when I use and wash it it'll change a lot so I'll kind of show it to you on my face pretty big but I can probably powder with it probably you know similar to this one 
um, blush or highlighter and actually big enough I can do bronzer with this as well so these actually um these actually are shaped very similarly the zero zero the 282 and the my sakura yeah they're shaped very similarly just this the sakura one is much thicker and much longer so it's focusing now and I'll show it to you against the, the blush one. So I do favor this um, round pom-pom shape um, for blush. But um, yeah, the, this line, they're not like terribly expensive, especially with the exchange rate. So I still think it's a good deal. And because it's mixed, you know, those are a little bit, you know, sometimes a little bit harder to find. I think as I use it more, it'll feel the same to this one because I've actually washed this twice already. So all right, I'll give you guys a, a quick close up of the brushes that I just got. I'll do the two face brushes here. And the eye brushes. All right, so that's um, that's gonna do it for the haul. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm gonna put on the um, the cultural presentation right now. So today I prepared a little presentation about Japanese culture and history, and the topic is gonna be the beauty standards of ancient Japan, and these kind of um, went into more of the modern age. Uh, I'll explain that in a little bit. So just some background. A lot of this evidence was found through ancient texts, paintings, drawings, and excavation of bo you know, bones and you know, teeth and things like that. So they found a lot of evidence for these things in multiple ways. And um, just going into reasons why Japan developed very distinct, um, I guess, social and cultural um, aspects that are very unique to the country is um, the Tokugawa period, which they consider 1603 to 1867. Japan um, was in a state of isolation. So if you were a Japanese citizen and you left the country, you weren't allowed to come back and foreigners weren't allowed to, uh, to Japan, not even to visit. And beauty standards are just one of the many things that uh, developed during this time. I mean, it had been going on um, previously, so a lot of this evidence was found as early as the Heian period, and that's a long time ago. They consider that 794 to 1185 AD, and this is where historians um, predict that Japan broke off of the influence of China and um, Korea. I don't think it was Korea yet, but what we know today is the Korean Peninsula. So it was kind of a, um, you know, a long period of the cultivation of a lot of unique and distinguished Japanese um, practices. So the beauty standards were quite different from other parts of the world. And I'm going to put a picture up here with a illustration. And for the most part, looking at ancient um, paintings and drawings, the um, stereotypical beautiful Japanese woman, they pretty much looked the same. So um, they all had long black thick hair, uh, while them had shaved eyebrows. In fact, there was a practice where they would not only shave the eyebrows, but they would um, like paint uh, like a black, look like little tufts of hair, like really high on their forehead. Uh, I'll try to find a picture of that. I, I have seen it, it's very, very odd looking. Also, um, a tall nose, um, very slim eyes, also thin lips. In fact, a lot of when they, um, like the geisha Michael and the more, um, you know, higher class women, they would paint their lips red, but like within their lip line to make them look thinner. 
and a narrow oval face. So a lot of these ancient paintings, women have very long faces. Also very white faces, which they use that white powder to achieve also. And another thing that was considered beautiful was many layers of clothing. That was a sign of status and wealth. So, um, you know, not, not nothing too crazy, but there is one thing that I found that I found very bizarre and quite unique. I have um, read some things that this practice was done outside of Japan. So I was talking about the practice of blackening of the teeth, mainly done by women, but not necessarily. And the Japanese called that ohaguro. And it was a process. It wasn't just like a one-time thing. It was something generally started when a woman was coming of age. Oftentimes when they got married, they would start this process of blackening their teeth. So um, there's a lot of speculation as to why this happened because it you know looking at it from you know the past few hundred years doesn't really make sense but um there are some theories on why one of them which has been found to not be correct was to prevent women from cheating on their husbands because they you know look so unattractive but most like social scientists have um come to the conclusion that wasn't the case that wasn't really the role of um, women within society. It wasn't like a lot of things like that. Another thing that the Westerners thought for a long time because they didn't understand why, they just thought their te teeth were rotten and they were very repulsed by this. And that makes sense because in other countries when your teeth rot, that's you know what they look like, they still look like. Um, but what I think is the more popular explanation for the origin of this practice was that back then black shiny things were considered very beautiful and very admired like uh, a black lacquered um, you know pottery uh, things like that and so that's why women started making their teeth look like that i think that's probably more likely from where it comes from. But this practice was done for a long time. And in fact, it wasn't outlawed until 1870. So the Meiji government pretty much made it illegal because Japan was starting to incorporate themselves to the rest of the world. And it was one of those things that outsiders found very repulsive. So there was a princess I guess like the highest ranking princess who like stopped doing it and that kind of helped you know women kind of get away from this practice uh, it was not only women mainly women um, women of higher status also geisha and michael did it but also some men did it as well but most of the depictions you will see of this practice is with women uh, adult women and um, there's also some evidence that it was practiced in China, Thailand, and Laos. So I thought, I just thought this was a very interesting topic and I hope you guys enjoyed um, this content and I will see you all next time. Bye.